Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. Um, ask you to keep yourselves muted. Um, makes it easier for everybody. Um, how are you all? I hope everybody is well, and I hope more and more of us are getting vaccinated. I'm going next week. And you have to hope that it's just going to get better. Uh, so tonight, Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, something like that. Uh, he was born on 7th of May, 1840, and he died on the 6th of November, 1893. He died when he was 53. The short story is he was brought up in a military household, and he was lucky that he had access to serious musical training at a time when Russian education was just opening up to the West. He expanded his compositional voice to include Russian and Western compositional elements. And in doing so, he created a style that we recognize to this day. His personal life was difficult and tortured. And while we don't know a lot about it, we can only imagine. Anyway, let's start at the beginning. I'm gonna show you a picture of his family in 1848. Uh, his twin brothers, Modeste and Anatoly, would not be born until 1850. So this is his family. Uh, Tchaikovsky is all the way on the left. Um, and his mother was 18 years younger than his father. His father had been married before his first wife died. Um, he was born in Vodkinsk which was a very small rural town about 750 miles to the east of Moscow, to the southeast, into a family with long history of military and civil service. Um, Tchaikovsky's mother, as I said, was his second wife, and she was younger. She was French and German on her father's side. And Tchaikovsky's father was a mine inspector and a metal works manager. But the family had a a good training in the arts, which in those days was a necessity as a posting to a remote area in Russia also meant a need for entertaining. There was no TV. And so music and and making music was um, part of life. Um, of his six siblings, Tchaikovsky was the closest to his sister Alexandra and his twin brothers Anatoly and Modest. His mother would have seven children altogether, and this would really be the only real family that Tchaikovsky would know as an adult, especially during his years when he was wandering. When he was four, the family hired a French governess. She helped the young Tchaikovsky study alongside his older siblings. And by the age of six, he was fluent in French and German. He began piano lessons at age five, and within three years, he was as adept at sight reading as was his music teacher. Although his parents were supportive of his musical talent, when he was 10, they decided to send him to boarding school, to the Imperial School of Jurisprudence in St. Petersburg, which was 1,200 miles away. 
They hoped this would prepare him for a career as a civil servant. As in Russia in those days, careers in mu music were considered the lowest rank of the social ladder. In addition, it seems that maybe his father's income was growing more uncertain, and so both parents wanted Tchaikovsky to become independent as soon as possible. If you ask me, 10 years old is a little early. Um, the minimum age for acceptance at this school was 12. So since he was only 10, he had to spend two years in a preparatory boarding school, um, and he was really far away from his mother, really. This early separation from his mother caused really emotional trauma that lasted for the rest of his life. And it was intensified when uh, she died of cholera in 1854 when he was 14. But the loss of his mother also prompted him to make his first serious attempt to add composition, uh, a waltz in her memory, which I couldn't find. I found references to it, but I couldn't find the music. Uh, while Tchaikovsky was very musical and was given musical training, none of his contacts, none of his parents' contacts during that in time encouraged him to pursue a life in music. Musicians in Russia at the time were treated so negatively and no one wanted to encourage the boy to go into such a difficult future. In fact, his father asked the boy's piano teacher if he saw anything in him and the piano teacher said that he, he saw nothing that suggested a potential composer or even a fine composer, a performer, go figure. So he graduates in 1859 when he's 19 with the rank of titular counselor, a low rung on the civil servant ladder. He quickly became a senior assistant and it was a position that he, he held um, for, the, for the three years of his civil service. Subsequently, the Russian Music Society, the precursor to the conservatory in St. Petersburg, which was run by Anton Rubinstein and whose younger brother Nikolai became a great friend of Tchaikovsky's, was founded. And as soon as he could, Tchaikovsky enrolled and he studied harmony, composition, instrumentation, and counterpoint as part of the school's premier class. I have a picture of him from that time. This is Tchaikovsky as a 23-year-old. He looks very young to me for 23. Um, but this was taken when he was in the, in the conservatory. These classes benefited him in two ways. First, he was transformed into a musical professional. He, he had the exposure and performance time there. And also he ha had access to European musical principles and forms, which gave him a sense that his art, that his sensibility of art was not exclusively Russian nor Western. He believed and attempted to show that both these aspects, the Russian and the in, in European were, as this is a quote from him, intertwined and mutually dependent. His efforts became both an inspiration and a starting point for later Russian composers to build their own individual styles. By the time he graduated from the St. Petersburg Conservatory, Rubinstein's younger brother, Nikolai, offered him the post of professor of music theory at the, at the, soon, at the just opened Moscow Conservatory. From 1867, so when he was 27, until 1878, he combined his professorial duties with music criticism while continuing to compose. This activity exposed him, arranged him to a range of contemporary music and afforded him the opportunity to travel abroad. He was really critical in his reviews. If he didn't like something, he, so he praised Beethoven, but he considered Brahms overrated. And despite his admiration for Schumann, took him to task for poor orchestration. He loved the staging of Wagner's Ring which he went to the uh, inaugural performance in Bayreuth, but he didn't like the music. He called Rheingold unlikely nonsense, and this is a quote, through which from time to time sparkle unusually beautiful and astonishing details. As well, a recurring theme he addressed was the poor state of Russian opera. So he tried to get his students to, make, to compose more. 
His education at the St. Petersburg Conservatory set him apart from the nationalist movement, which uh, called the Five, which included Mussorgsky, Rimsikorskov, and Bordin. I'm going to show you where uh, Tchaikovsky fits in relative time-wise, age-wise, relative to these, um, these composers. So Glinka was really like the father of pure Russian music. Um, and he set the stage for this dichotomy between Russian and, and maybe Russian music with an European influence. So Rubinstein, who was a, a, a composer, a conductor, pianist, and the director of the school, was just a little younger than uh, uh, Tchaikovsky. Borodin, Mussorgsky, and Korsakov were all around the same age as, as, um, as Tchaikovsky. And by rights, they should have been uh, colleagues. Um, but his professional relationship with them was mixed. In fact, Mussorgsky hated him. Uh, but that's a discussion for another night. I'm not going to. Basically, their difference were, differences were about whether Russian music should include Western influences. Also, none of the five had been formally academically trained in composition. Anyway, his training set him on a path to reconcile what he had learned in conservatory with the native musical practices to which he has been, had been exposed in childhood. The principles that govern melody, harmony, and other fundamentals of Russian music ran completely counter to those that govern Western music which you can hear if you listen to say, Boris Goodenough by Mussorgsky. It's just a completely different sensibility of how music is put together. Russian culture exhibited a split personality with its native and adopted European elements having drifted apart and increasingly since the time of Peter the Great. And I thought, I, well, I was shocked to see this, but Peter the Great reigned from 1682 to 1725. So, 150 years or more before Tchaikovsky was alive, Peter the Great made this effort to include uh, Russia in, in Europe, and he tried to make it more modern. And the debate about that was still going on actually almost 200 years ago. So it, the, it was the division between what they called the Slavophiles, uh, which idealized Russian history before Peter the Great, and the Zapadniki, which were westernizers, who saw Peter the Great as a patriot who wanted to reform his country and bring it on par with the rest of Europe. As an aside, it's interesting for me because in the course of doing these talks, I've seen that there were very many countries during the latter part of the 19th century who had a really strong sense of nationalism. Um, and maybe because in the beginning of the 1800s, there was so much domination of one country by another, Italy and the Austrians, France and the Germans, Czech Czechoslovakia and the Austro-Hungarians, that, that maybe artists began to think, okay, who am I? What, what do I think? What's my native art? Um, and I, this is gonna be a topic for a future talk because I find it interesting in not only music, but in art. And if anybody has any ideas about all, any of that, send me an email um, or, or tell me at the end. Anyway, back to Tchaikovsky. He wasn't awful, often musically successful. His music was hard won to be popular. And that, the, the, the lack of success along with his lifelong sensitivity to criticism, and maybe he was very critical of himself in the way he was critical of others, made it really difficult for him uh, to feel confident. But over time, several first-rate artists became willing to perform his compositions, making him more well-known and more popular. Another factor that helped his works become more popular was a shift in attitude among Russian audiences. While previously, they had been eager to hear flashy virtuoso performances of technically demanding but musically lightweight works. They gradually began to listen with increasing appreciation of the composition itself. 
During the late 1860s, Tchaikovsky began to compose operas. There were several early operas, which the composer himself was very dissatisfied with. Voyevoda, Udina, Mandragora, which don't survive as he hated them so much that he destroyed the manuscripts. Two early operas which do survive are called Oprichnik and Vakula the Smith, but are not often performed. His very last opera was Yolanta in one act, which premiered in 1892, but is also very rarely uh, performed. I think the first performance at the Met was in 2010 or something. Despite his many popular successes, his life was punctuated by personal crises and de depression, starting with the death of his mother, later the, the death of his close friend Nikolai Rubinst Rubinstein, who was the brother of Anton Rubinstein, who was his mentor. Ru uh, Nikolai dies in 1881 at age 45, and then his disastrous foray into marriage in 1877. He was 37 and he married a woman who said she was his student. In any case, she said she was his fan. This is them on their honeymoon. She had written him, and I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get back to this later, but she had written him for four years. She said she was in love with him for four years. And uh, he, she wrote him letters and letters and letters. And um, the marriage was a disaster. It was a complete disaster. It lasted less than three months. After nine weeks, he walked into the icy Moscow River trying to commit suicide because he couldn't find, figure out another way out of it. He was saved, but he had terrible writer's block after that, um, brought on by this emotional suffering. Luckily, his family was supportive of him during this crisis and throughout his life in every crisis. At the same time, he acquired a devoted patroness, the widow Nadzeza, I don't know how to say it, von Meck, who, was, who would turn out to be an important friend and patroness of his for 13 years, from 1877 to 1890. She supplied him, supported him with a monthly allowance so that he could focus exclusively on composition. Tchaikovsky called her his, quote, best friend, but they agreed never to meet under any circumstances. Um, let me show you what she looks like. This is her. And she was an ardent supporter of his for many years. And they had incredibly intimate correspondence between them. They wrote very frequently and they were very um, explicit letters. Um, he, he, excuse me. He told her everything. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he told her all the details about his marriage, every detail of his, his daily life, he seems to have described to her, and she to him. Their, their correspondence went back and forth. In the end, during that time, the year following his, the disintegration of his marriage, Tchaikovsky went abroad. His correspondence with von Meck was a huge support to him during that time. And eventually he was able to finish uh, Eugene Onegin. He orchestrated his fourth symphony and composed the famous violin concerto. He had uh, assistance from a, a very fantastic violinist, a guy named Josef Kotak, uh, who was indispensable to um, Tchaikovsky writing the concerto, you know, telling him how things worked. Um, and the two became very good friends. Uh, Tchaikovsky's on the right. Tchaikovsky in this time describes himself as a, as a fat middle-aged man. <laughs> um, so a short of regular income from von Meck, he spent the next year traveling incessantly throughout Europe and rural Russia, mainly alone and avoiding social contact whenever possible. And then suddenly in 1890, another tragedy in his life, the collapse of the one enduring relationship in his adult life, the 13 year association with Madame von Meck. In 1890, she abruptly ended the, the association, sending him a check for the entire year's support. She had been sending him monthly checks before then and writing that she was bankrupt. 
it seems perhaps that she was in fact facing some financial difficulties, but also that she was seriously ill. She had tuberculosis and had lost the use of her writing arm. And I think to have to dictate these letters to him through a third person, they were so personal, it would have caused her family great distress. And in fact, it does seem that her children were embarrassed by her close relationship with Tchaikovsky. And the break from Madame von Meck was very difficult for Tchaikovsky, as she had really been his confidant and mother figure for so many years, not to mention her financial support, which had allowed him to compose freely. He had been so very productive and had gained fame and popularity during the time of her support. During that time, during those 13 years, despite the, the unwillingness of a, a certain faction of Russian artists to reject him because he was too Western, uh, Dostoevsky at the unveiling of the Pushkin Monument uh, in 1880 made a call for universal unity his words encouraged the public to accept Tchaikovsky's music, which until then had been considered too dependent on the West. From that period, two works stand out. The 1812 Overture, which was written to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the coronation of Alexander II in 1880. So we know the, the big parts of, uh, this is interesting. Uh, we know the big parts of the 1812 Overture, but the beginning is something that you don't often remember. It's so beautiful. I'm just going to play a few, few moments of it. This is the very beginning of it. So I don't know if you saw my, my um, quotes at the beginning. And what I wanted to say is, um, I've, in listening to a lot more of Tchaikovsky's music in this week and thinking about it, a lot of what he writes is scale, stepwise scale, um, scale passages. Like there was no melody there. Bom, 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 right? It just was like a scale, and, but incredibly beautiful and uh, touching. Um, and what I played at the beginning, the pathétique, was also bom, ba, da, 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 bom, ba, da, da, da. So not really a melody, but scale-wise passages that are orchestrated in a way that are, are very poignant. Anyway, so uh, we're going to go on. Um, and at the same time, he wrote the piano trio in A minor, which was de dedicated to the memory of Nikolai Rubinstein, who had been so supportive of Tchaikovsky's early years and had been a close friend who died suddenly in 1881 at the age of 45 of tuberculosis. The trio was written in Rome in 1881-82 and has only two movements. The first movement is called Pezzo Elegiaco, which is an elegy. And the second movement is a theme and variations with 11 variations. And the piece is marked A la mémoire d'un grand artiste.
In 1884, Tsar, Tsar Alexander III conferred on him the Order of St. Vladimir, which includes a title of hereditary nobility and a personal audience with the Tsar. This was seen as the seal, seal of a approval for Tchaikovsky, and it also advanced his social standing. It made him socially more popular, and um, it, I think, also encouraged him to be more social. Um, so during this time, despite his disdain for public life, he begins to participate in social life as part of his cel cel celebrity. And out, of a, and out of a duty, he felt to promote Russian music. He invites many international ce celebrities to conduct, including Johannes Brahms, An Antonin Dvorak, and Jules Massenet. And he himself begins to travel more. Here's a picture of him from Paris in 1888 seems like a very handsome, kind-hearted man. He begins promoting Russian music as a conductor himself, overcoming his stage fright to, uh, and traveling as far as the United States to conduct for the opening performance of Carnegie Hall in 1891, conducting his own piece, March Solonel. As an aside, you should go to the Carnegie Hall website, and there's a charming video about this event. Just look up Tchaikovsky opening of Carnegie Hall. It's really nice. In 1893, in January, so he dies in November, he travels to Odessa and conducts five concerts there. If we look at his legacy, we see that thanks to the patronage of Nadzeja von Meck, he was the first full-time Russian composer. He had the time and the means she handsomely supported him, including enough to support his ex-wife or his wife who ended up in a, in a, in a loony bin so that he could explore his own cre creativity and the freedom to explore Western compositional practices that he learned at the St. Petersburg Conservatory, the Russian folk song and other native elements and fulfill his own expressive goals to forge an original and deeply personal style which I might add was not, would not be possible some 30 years later, uh, maybe 40 years later in, in the early 1910. Sometime we'll talk about the difference between let's say Prokofiev style, who was an adult before the Russian revolution and had been able to travel in the West to Shostakovich style, who was forever under surveillance by the Stalinist regime. Again, that's a conversation for another moment. If you're interested and you have the time, I can re recommend a book called The Noise of Time by Julian Barnes. And it's essentially about Shostakovich, but it talks a lot about what happened in the Russian Revolution to music and, and what was going on before then. Anyway, <clears throat> Tchaikovsky is one of the few Russian composers who has left a legacy of works in almost every configuration symphonies, operas, ballets, concertos, piano solo, chamber music. He wrote three quartets, a piano trio, and a lovely piece called Souvenir de Florence for a string sextet. He worked, wrote choral works and more. So the big thing that people talk about with Tchaikovsky is his sudden death at the age of 53. Generally, it is ascribed to cholera, but there's an ongoing debate as to whether or not cholera was indeed the cause of his death. Apparently, he was in a restaurant during a time of a great cholera outbreak. The waiter told him that there was no boiled water available, and he, water, he, ordered, he ordered cold, unboiled water. In the ensuing days, he refused medical treatment, leading scholars to believe that the cause of his death was suicide. However, this is completely not definitive by many scholars over the years. His homosexuality, which he kept private, has traditionally been considered a major factor in his music, though some musicologists now downplay its importance. In 1986, Tony Bluth and Donald Richardson of Santa Monica's College of Music Department came across an article, newly translated from the Russian, which indicated that Tchaikovsky had been persuaded to commit suicide after a homosexual affair. Apparently, a letter of complaint had been lodged by a ranking member of the nobility, and rather than expose the nature of the complaint, 
that Tchaikovsky had corrupted the nephew of an important figure in nobility to engage in homosexual love affair. A kangaroo court, a so-called court of honor, made up of his former law school classmates was convened. And it was decided that death was the only way the composer could avoid bringing international scandal on himself. And maybe more importantly, bringing scandal on the nobility and the family of the czar. They sentenced him to take his own life, provided the poison, and amazingly, he carried out the grim sentence. After all, Tchaikovsky was one of the most celebrated composers in the world when he died in 1893. He had received honorary doctorates from Oxford and Cambridge. He had traveled all the way to New York to participate in the opening of Carnegie Hall. But Russian law was very clear on the consequences of homosexual acts, which could be punished by exile, public lashing, and worse. And the young man with whom Tchaikovsky was involved was the nephew of Duke Audrey Stenbach, Thurmer, who threatened to write the Tsar, informing him of Tchaikovsky's shocking behavior. Richardson and Bluth claim that in order to ensure that he was buried in the Russian Orthodox Church, which denies funerals to suicides, he masked his suicide by, po po by poison, by ostent ost ostentatiously drinking a glass of unboiled water in a St. Peter's Rest, uh, St. Petersburg restaurant during a cholera epidemic. There is other information which lead us to imagine suicide. In those days, a patient afflicted with cholera had to adhere to a strict quarantine. There are records which show that in the four days preceding his death, there was a steady stream of visitors to his bedside. And when he actually died, he was in the presence of 16 people, four doctors, his brothers, sisters, nephews, servants, nurses, and a priest. In addition, after his death, none of the customary precautions were followed. His body remained on view for two days instead of being immediately sealed in a zinc coffin as the rules of the time dictated for cholera. It was noted that this was strange. Rimsky-Korsakov wrote, quote, how strange, Tchaikovsky died from cholera, but access to his body was completely unobstructed, unquote. He added that many people kissed Tchaikovsky's face as they filed by the beer. The bottom line was that suicide and homosexuality were without question outside the limits of a society that was at that time more Victorian than England's, England himself. We'll never know. Ironically, it was Oscar Wilde's trial of 1895 with its enormous resonance in the English speaking world that precipitated negative tendencies in the reception and critical judgment of Tchaikovsky's art. From that moment on, the as essentialist curse, which, i.e., that the homosexual was defined not by his acts, but by his character, and I quote, quote, a character that was certified to be diseased, hence necessarily alien to that of healthy normal people, unquote. And everything written about Tchaikovsky from that moment, the late 1800s, uh, the late end, was affected by the issue of his personal life. If we consider his music within the context of contemporary Russia, contemporary to his own time and our own, and if you consider Vladimir Putin's stance on, stance on gay people, where church and state yield lots of influence on cultural matters, it gets very complicated. I've read that Tchaikovsky's gayness matters as much as Beethoven's deafness or Mozart's troubles with his father or Schumann's mental Ill illness. Do you agree? Do you think his sexual orientation is relevant to his art? In recent years, there have been more letters released from, <clears throat> from his family, particularly correspondence with his brother Modeste, who was also gay, and perhaps because he was not famous, was able to live with his lover for years, that reveal that it is not the fact of his sexuality that seemed to be the cause of his personal torture and maybe his musical inspiration. Rather, it seems that the near universal artist struggle with self-doubt, coupled with longing brought about by un unrequited love, also a common human experience, that is at the core of Tchaikovsky's suffering, i.e. it wasn't so much that he was gay, it was that he couldn't find fulfillment in his love. And even his marriage, which essentially was him giving in to a woman who had pestered him for years, was him basically saying, okay, I give in to society, we can get married, but we don't have to consummate, and my parents will be thrilled. But it turned out that she was mentally unstable, which he should have noticed. She claimed she was in love with him for four years, and yet she had never been to one of his concerts. 
Eventually, she held his inability to consummate the marriage against him. And after they split up, she went off the rails, ending in an asylum, causing him further stress and anxiety. Anyway, I'm off the track. I think in, in the same way that we really don't need to or shouldn't categorize art in subsets that have nothing to do with art, i.e. woman painter, for instance, I think we should leave aside the details of Tchaikovsky's personal life. The music is splendid period. Uh, and on that note, let me show you a picture of him from the year he died. This is Tchaikovsky in Odessa. Um, and his sister lived not really close, but relatively close. And his sister, Alexander, she lived in, I can't remember, it starts with a K, it'll come back to me. Um, and he loved being there. He loved this part of, of, of Russia. All right, so let's look at Onyegin. The opera is based on a novel, a novel written in verse by the same name by Pushkin, Alexander Pushkin. This is Pushkin. Um, he wrote the novel. Uh, he lived from 1799 to 1837, so he was 38 when he died. Um, and he wrote the novel uh, in in it, it was serials. It was it was in a magazine. It came out bit by bit. Uh, he's considered by many to be the greatest Russian poet and the founder of the modern Russian of modern Russian literature, the 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 Russian Shakespeare, let's say, uh, Byron. Uh, Onyegin, so you have to listen to this carefully. It's a novel in verse. It is made up of 389 14 line stanzas of iambic tetrameter. 5,446 5, lines in all, with a very unusual rhyme scheme. So the rhyme scheme is big A, little b, big A, little b, big C, big C, little d, little d. And the, the uppercase letters represent feminine rhymes, which describes a line which ends in a stressless syllable, and the lower case letters represent masculine rhymes, which is a line which ends in a stress syllable. So it's either da, 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 where the last syllable is not stressed, or da, 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 da. Okay, and a nice, a nice uh, example of this is uh, this poem by Henry uh, Wadsworth Longfellow, um, which I'm sure all of us memorized when we were young. Um, so lines one and three have a feminine end, line two and four are masculine. And it's not, it, this, this poem is not strictly in iambic, iambic tetrameter, which is four things. So tell me not in mournful numbers. So the last syllable is not stressed, so that's feminine. Life is but an empty dream, stress. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. So. I can't imagine writing a novel like this. Um, this form, the 14 line stanza with the unusual rhyme pattern has become to, has come to be known as the Pushkin sonnet. And I challenge everybody to try and write one. Um, iambic tetrameter and the, and the weird rhyme scheme. And if you want, I'll send you the rhyme scheme. Um, so Pushkin's novel is told by a narrator who seems to have a rather snarky tone while he is, but he is educated, worldly, and intimate. He, he knows the behavior of the social class of the day and he is observing it. Um, in the opera, Tchaikovsky does away with the narrator and we watch the story unfold directly. The story, which I'll get to in a moment, is rather simple, which is why Tchaikovsky doesn't actually call it an opera he refers to it as lyrical scenes. There's not much plot, which may also be why Pushkin uses a narrator to provide commentary. The novel was written and published serially, as were many 19th century works of fiction, each chapter often appearing in magazines. The entire book was published in 1833, and there's a beautiful translation by Vladimir Nabokov. Uh, the translation is very difficult because of the way the verse happens and you have to know Russian and English really well. Um, anyway, uh, but uh, Pushkin begins work on Eugene Onegin in 1823 and the first chapter appears in 1825. 
And the, the story deals with three major themes. The first is the relationship between reality and fiction. The main woman, Tatiana, always has her no nose in a book and she longs for the kind of love that she reads about. She longs for the kind of life that she reads about. And this, this dichotomy between reality and fiction is a, is a, is a common theme. Second, Pushkin creates the model of the woman of intelligence and depth in Tatiana, who serves as inspiration to other great Russian heroines. Um, and there are other, so there's Anna Karenina, there's Sonia in Crime and Punishment, there's Natalia in War and Peace, and Margarita in The, in the Master and Margarita. Of course, you've all read all of these, right? Um, and the third, theme. So we have uh, fiction and reality, we have strong, intelligent women, and um, the darkest theme, the third theme, is that of the uh, inhumanity, inhumanity of social convention. Um, this theme he, he, he personifies in the character of Onyegin himself. Uh, a cad, a playboy, boy, bored by all of it. He's vain, he's selfish, he's indifferent, he's unable to be in, in empathetic and he's cruel. In the second act uh, of the opera, when he kills Lenski, who is his best friend in a duel and he rejects Tatiana, we see him as completely cold and unfeeling. So the mores of the day make it impossible for him to navigate this situation and so he becomes just a cad. Onyegin ends up losing what could have been his love, and he kills his only friend, and he ends up finding no satisfaction in life. Um, this conflict between art and life was no mere fiction in Russia, as Pushkin himself was killed in a duel, defending the honor of his wife in keeping with the social conventions of Russian high society. He had no choice. So the opera. Apparently Tchaikovsky hesitated before, this was brought up at a dinner party, and he hesitated before choosing Onyegin as a subject. He worried, uh, first of all, that he didn't want to mess with national masterpiece by Pushkin. He just thought, oh, this is like, I'm not, I'm not up to it. Also, he was afraid that there wasn't enough drama to hold the attention of the current uh, day theater going public. It may be that he might have been a little influenced by the insistent letters of, from Antonina, his nine week bride, and it war that warmed him to the to the story of the uh, the you know Tatiana's letter to Onyegin in the story. In any case, eventually he read it and he was obsessed. Uh, he he basically wrote the libretto himself. Uh, pretty much, he stuck to Pushkin, um, and he did have a coll collaborator, his friend Konstantin Shilovsky, uh, contributed the text for Monsieur Triquet's verses in Act Two, and Tchaikovsky wrote the text for Lenski's aria, and he pretty much wrote all of of Grayman's. And interesting to note uh, that Grayman doesn't actually show up in, Grayman is Tatiana's husband and he has a beautiful aria in the opera. Um, and I think basically it's because you can't have a Russian opera without a bass aria. Um, but Grayman doesn't really have a, a, a role in, in Pushkin's story. Um, in the opera, Tchaikovsky captures two of Russian, culture, Russian culture's enduring archetypes that of the world, worldly educated man who lacks drive and purpose, who languishes into ennui. In short, what Russia, in Russia becomes labeled as the superfl superfluous man. And uh, the other uh, archetype is the good feminine, the strong, intelligent woman who is considered the soul of Russia. In the end, and this is from a letter to his brother Modeste, he writes, quote, let my opera be undramatic. Let it have little action. I am in love with the image of Tatiana. I'm enraptured with Pushkin's verse, and I'm writing music for them because I feel drawn to them." Unquote. So here we are, uh, the characters in the opera. Characters in the opera. We have Larina, who is uh, Tatiana's mother. It's the house of Larina. Uh, we have Tatiana, who is a soprano, and Olga, who is a Contralto. We have her nanny, we have Lenski and Onyegin. Lenski is a tenor, Onyegin is a baritone, and Grenin is a, is a bass. Um, Zaretsky is the guy who uh, is the, he's the second during the duel. He's the one who says take, you know, 10 paces and whatever. Uh, but essentially, 
the story is there are two sisters, two men, two balls, and two letters, and each pair is contrasting. So Tatiana and Olga are sisters, but they couldn't be more different. Olga is blonde and she's the good time girl. Tatiana is brunette, intelligent, introverted, and always has her nose in a book. Then we have Onyegin, who is a cad, a playboy, and his friend Lenski, who is earnest and also bookish, and he's in love with Olga. So this sets Tatiana up with Onyegin, and immediately she has a huge crush on him, as all schoolgirls school girls do, on the bad boy. Later that night, after she meets him, Tatiana stays up all night writing a passionate love letter to Onyegin. This is a very famous scene, the letter aria. Uh, listen again, I'm gonna play it, and I'm sorry for those of you who can't hear it, but you can look, look all this stuff up on, on YouTube, which is listen to the letter, letter aria. Uh, listen to the falling notes in the theme. Uh, we're listening to the Orchestra de Paris, Nuccia Focile singing Tatiana and Simon Bichkov conducting. Okay, so here's where she's writing the letter. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play any more excerpts because enough of you can't hear it. Some of you do hear it, some of you don't, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, and I'll make a list if you're interested, listen to it. What I find interesting about the music in this opera, which is why I don't have my viola with me today, is that the arias are not the kind that you go home singing. There's very poignant harmony and there's a very beautiful back and forth with single instruments in the orchestra. So there'd be the, the soprano is singing with the oboe uh, or the bassoon. And he really captures the angst of this feeling of unrequited love, of this like, this, I'm, 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 I'm yearning. Anyway, when Tatiana sees Onyegin the next day and she's waiting to see what he thinks of her letter, he rejects her. He's not unkind about it, but he tells her really, girl, you should be careful who you expose yourself to. You should just not, don't do that. So act two begins with a country ball. Um, and I say country ball because the pair of balls is there's a very fancy city ball that happens in the last act. So country ball for Tatiana, whose name day it is. Um, and in Russia, the name day is, is really more important than, uh, than the birthday. Uh, Onyegin is dancing with Tatiana, but he's becoming irritated with the small town gossip about them. And so he, out of boredom, he decides to flirt with Olga and he asks her to dance. Lenski becomes incredibly jealous, and this goes back and forth for a while, and eventually Lenski ends up challenging Onyegin to a duel to avenge her honor. So in the next scene, Lenski is uh, waiting for him. Of course, Onyegin is late to the duel, um, and he sings a beautiful aria, which I'm not even gonna try and play, but listen, listen to the, listen to the, um, this is Lenski's aria, it's, it's, like the most famous aria and it's also incredibly beautiful and the thing about it is that <clears throat> it's an aria where he he's musing on his lost youth the land the the words are kuda kuda which is where 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 have you gone the spring of my golden days will the day beam shine in the morning and the bright day shall rain and i well will i Perhaps will I descend into mysterious darkness of my fatal tomb? You have to realize that he's reflecting on his life, his fear of death, and, and he goes on to sing of his love for Olga. And he's only 18 years old. This is like, how, 
how uh, the society at that point made these things so important. Anyway, I was going to play the, the thing, but I won't. Both men are reduct reluctant to go through with the duel. It's senselessness so apparent, and their friendship also so apparent, but it's too late. Neither man has the courage to stop the duel. And in, in this fatalistic kind of way, I also think, you know, Tchaikovsky could have just left Russia. He didn't have to kill himself. There was so much social pressure to do the things, the norms that were prescribed for them, that it was just awful. Anyway, Act 3. Five years pass. Onyegin has traveled a lot in Europe. Uh, he's alone at a fancy city ball, in contrast to the country ball in Act 2. Fancy city ball in St. Petersburg, and he's thinking about the emptiness of his life and he, his remorse over killing Lenski. Prince Grimmin enters with his wife, and they are greeted by the, with deference by the guests. And Onyegin realizes that, Onye, that Grimmin's wife is Tatiana, and now she is a grand aristocratic and beautiful woman, and he is overwhelmed by her and her noble bearing. Tatiana, too, is overwhelmed by her feelings seeing Onyegin, but she tries to suppress them. Grayman, which is an invention by Tchaikovsky, he doesn't really have a role in the Pushkin novel, um, but to make a, an aria for a bass, and it's a beautiful aria. He sings a beautiful aria extolling the wonders of love and his happiness and his love for Tatiana. And while he's singing, Onyegin becomes aware of the fact that, that his own feelings, that he's in love with Tatiana. So he goes home and he writes her a letter. And this is the second letter in the opera. And he asks to meet with her. Tatiana receives his letter, which has stirred up the passion she felt for him as a young woman. She's really disturbed and she asks him, she goes to see him and she, and she says, why are you pursuing me now? Is it because I finally have social standing? Onyegin denies any cynical motivation. Tatiana is moved to tears. She realizes how close they once were to real happiness, but nevertheless, she asks him to leave. He doesn't give up easily, but she stands firm. She bids him for farewell, leaving him alone and in despair. And that's the end of the opera. An interesting note, though, of all of these Russian heroines, Tatiana is the only one who ends up at the end of the, of the story standing. Uh, she has chosen a steady life, and she has a man who loves her, and she's She's got a good situation. In, 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 all, in all of those other stories, Sonia in Crime and Punishment ends up selling her body. And the others in War and Peace, The Master of Margarita, and Anna Karenina, all of those women die. Uh, the opera had its premiere on the 29th of March, 1879, with Nikolai Rubinstein, Tchaikovsky's great friend, conducting. Tchaikovsky was worried that the public might not like it. And considering that there were not a lot of fancy ch scene changes, so to that end, he entrusted the score to the students of the Moscow Conservatory to, just to be safe. It made its premiere at, at the Bolshoi in St. Petersburg two years later. The first performance outside Russia was in Prague, conducted by Tchaikovsky himself and sung in Czech. In 1892, Gustav Mahler conducted the premiere in Hamburg, sung in German, and Tchaikovsky was in the audience, and the audience went crazy for him. And they, they applauded after every aria. They applauded Tchaikovsky after every aria, and, and at the end of the opera, he got a huge ovation. Uh, the opera outside of Russia was re received lukewarmly. It was seen as sort of a Russian, you know, a, a, a folk curiosity. It made its premiere at the Metropolitan Opera on the 24th of March in 1920, sung in Italian. Go figure. Uh, in all, at the Met, uh, the Met has given 155 performances of the opera. The 153rd performances, performance was conducted by my re dear and recently deceased friend Joel Revson, who is the founder of the festival that I play in in Tahoe, and who succumbed last year to, Tahoe, to COVID. And he did a marvelous job conducting that night. I remember at the last moment he, uh, Gergiev didn't show up, and at the last moment he came on to conduct. Um, one of the productions on the Met Player is, and the one that they, they played last Saturday, is the spare Robert Carson production from 2007 with Rene Fleming as Tatiana, Dmitry Horostrovsky as Onyegin, Ramon Vargas as Lenski, and Elena Zaremba as Olga. Um, also worth seeing, though, if you ever if it ever comes up or if any of you have the Met Player, 
is the production by Deborah Warner from 2013 with Anna Netrebko and Marius Krishin. Um, it was really good. But really for me, the music and the interpretation of the music by the orchestra will always be the, the, the thing that uh, this opera, uh, the star of this haunting and passionate opera. Okay, that's all I got. Do we have questions? I'm going to put, <laughs> unmute yourselves. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So I, I've, I've seen three versions that I saw two with Anna Netrebko and the one with Renee Fleming. And um, I just wonder if you, what you think about the spare staging of the, the one with Renee Fleming. Do you think it adds to the opera? It's kind of like that, that Traviata where they have the bare stage with a clock. Right. Um, I'm a sucker for costumes and glitz, I have to say. Um, but I also think, and maybe it's because I know that Horstovsky is dead mm -hmm. and, um, and he, you know, he's Russian. I mean, and, and I know that that production was, uh, it was risky because it put two Americans with two Russians on stage to do a Russian opera. Um, you know, I, I, I it's like children. I can't say which one I like better. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever meet Dmitry Vortovsky? You know, when the Met used to tour, so we haven't toured since 2011. And when the Met used to tour, um, we had more access to the singers, but really in the house, um, we don't get to rehearse with the stage until like, three or four rehearsals until the opening night. And then nobody, nobody's hanging out and, and there's no, there, it's a big distance between where the orchestra hangs out and where the singers hang out. Um, and I'm sure on tour- Don't you have rehearsals in the rehearsal room? Cause they showed a little clip. Yes, there. downstairs. But again, the, singer, the singers come in after we're already sitting and warming up and they, they leave. Yeah. <laughs> it's, there's just not a lot of, uh, of, of uh, you know, on tour, you know, you'd be on the same airplane and you'd be in the same hotel and everybody would be like, we would spend a month in Japan and you'd get to know a lot of people really well because you'd be like walking out of the hotel and they'd be going, where are you going? Where are you going? We'd just have dinner with people who, or you'd be on the subway. I was on the subway with uh, Piotr Tenor, can't remember his last name. It was such a nice guy talking about his kids and he was asking us about our kids and I was with a colleague of mine who had her kid with her and you know, but since we don't, we haven't toured in so long and I should, full disclosure, I retired uh, a month ago. So I shouldn't say we, since they, <laughs> thank you, Noreen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, people often ask, which one do you like best? <laughs> and, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I have to say, I like the ball scene in the Deborah uh, Warner. I just think it's beautiful. And it's also, you can sort of really imagine all of those social things where he comes in the ball and he sees her and everybody, it's just, I don't know. It's like what you go to the opera for is, is like fairy tale. So mm -hmm. any other questions? Could, could I say something? Absolutely. Right. Um, if anyone is interested, there's a, a contemporary dress version. I don't know what the opera house is, but it's up on YouTube with Peter Matei as Onyegin, and it's very interesting. Thank you. I love this opera, and I'm I'm grateful for you because you must have played in the in the orchestra. Yep. In the two performances. Yep. It's it's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's beautiful really in an un-Italian way, and it took me decades to figure that out. <laughs> right. You know, I so I, I I speak Italian. I lived in Italy, and when I and I worked in the opera in 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 Italy before I um, came back came back, um, and I, I always noticed the difference between the music and the language. Mm. So. And, and I also think, I, and this is something I, I, I wish I knew a linguist, but I've always wondered 
um, especially spending time in Japan, I've always wondered about the development of the language related to the culture. So a language develops in a certain way. And, and, and if, you know, in Japan, I think there are seven layers of politeness, but that the way the grammar, um, because like in Russian, there's not a lot of, of uh, I, I tried to study Russian for a little while. There's not a lot, I don't know if anybody here speaks Russian, but they don't use verbs a lot. You sort of say that house, this mother. You don't say this is a house, that is my mother because it's understood. And, and I think in a lot of ways, the like Russian music and the language and the culture, I don't know, it's just different. And I, and I have a feeling that that's what was going on in, in, uh, in, in Tchaikovsky's time is that they were rejecting any influence by a European culture that was so different than theirs. That, you know, I mean, and it's astounding how many times you read in 1860, 1870, 1880, that people were really becoming ultra nationalist about their own art. Um, and I, I, you know, I think, was there something in the water? Was there, you know, I don't know. So, cholera. Cholera. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what was that? What was that horrible uh, rivalry or hatred between Tchaikovsky and Mussorgsky, was it? Uh, Mussorgsky, yeah. Okay, so I, Mussorgsky, um, it, it had to do with class and uh, education. And, um, and I, I started reading about it and then I stopped reading about it. Um, because I didn't want to end up in a rabbit hole, but, and I want to look at it, but it had to do with um, this whole Western Russian thing, but also the quality of their education. And, and I think that Mussorgsky was sort of like Berlioz was that a lot of those guys were sort of self-taught. They played music, they listened to Russian music, and they just made stuff up without understanding or without, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be I don't want to say the wrong thing because I, I didn't read the whole thing, but you know, like Berlioz taught himself. So, and I'm actually, and I'd love to know from you guys, I, in doing this piece, I thought I would love to do a short sec segment on a little bit of music history a music theory and a little bit of um, the structure of a, of a symphony. Because I think if you understand something about um, harmony and, uh, and how uh, and a, a symphony is set to put together because it, it, it has a very, very clear structure that it'll change the way you, diff that you that you listen. So like the pathetique that we were listening to, the last movement has a theme one, a theme two, it develops it. And usually theme one is in the major, is in the tonic and Theme two is in a related key, which is called the dominant. And then there's some development and then it comes back. And in, in the, in the, in the uh, recap, in the last movement, theme two comes back minor and very sad. Whereas in, in the opening part of, of that theme two is like a ray of sunshine. And I, you'll have to listen to the last move, the last movement of the, of the, but it, it will change the way you listen to music if you have some kind of understanding of the structure of uh, of of music. And I don't know if you guys would, would be interested. Do it. I'd show up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I'd be interested too. Okay. Good. Because I like I have. Yes. So oh, would I. Okay. Good. <laughs> then I'll then maybe that's the next one I'm going to do, and it'll be short, and I'll have lots of good examples of pizzas you know. And I'm, I'm going to give you homework and say, go listen to something and tell me if you could hear, if you could hear this, because even if you have music training, it's still hard to always pay attention to what's going on. So, I mean, like Mike, Mike, you know, all of this, so this wouldn't be, but I, you know, there's, so I know Mike in a, in a, in a very specific way, but uh, I've also noticed that there are, for instance, my brother, my brother is a very accomplished violinist. But he doesn't necessarily know theory because he learned to play the violin and no one ever taught him how how music works so um 
And I might do a little bit with jazz too, because jazz is very, very, very much like classical music, harmonically. So uh, any other questions about Tchaikovsky? I have a question. From your um, up close and personal experience playing in the Met Orchestra for different conductors in this amazing opera, which has a more complex orchestral score than lots of operas do um, because of its composer. Um, how could you describe the difference between the Onegin you played for Gergiev and the Onegin you played for the conductor that you mentioned who was your friend and maybe you even played for Levine? Was that the, uh, Levine. yeah, Levine, yeah. What, what differences did the conductor make for you? Let me think if I can find a way to describe this. I think it's like tennis, hmm. right? I don't play tennis, but I can imagine that when you hit a ball with someone, uh, it's different with everybody, even though it's the same game. So with conductors, the things that, that the, the most obvious thing is that the tempo is often very different. So mm -hmm. uh, the tempo and the feeling of, uh, of urgency that the conductor conveys or the feeling of, of calm. Um, and it's, 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 I think it's like actors. You can see different actors saying the same words and they all have a different interpretation. And for us in the orchestra, um, you have to, it, or maybe it's like skiing, you have to stay, but the, more like tennis because you're dealing with another person. You have to stay, you have to stay um, focused, um, but also you get there through rehearsal period. And so you know that, uh, that, oh, in this spot, I've got to be careful because he's not going to wait the way the other guy did or, um, or, he, and, and there are, conductors who and I have a terrible memory so I can't I can't conjure specific I can conjure some specific performances but but I know that there are moments when a conductor interprets something in a certain way and gets us to play number one that you feel personally like you're in Carnegie Hall like you're playing your heart out and it really matters rather than being a cog in the machine which sometimes we feel sometimes you feel like you're all part of something that's so so there's that and he gives you the excitement. And also you go home and you're like, oh my God, that was so amazing. That was such an incredible performance. And, and I, think, I think that the orchestra could be perfectly fine without the conductor, but I think the conductor adds that je ne sais quoi. And I think when you have a performance that is just marvelous, it's because there's something special that happens between the stage, the orchestra and the conductor. Um, and it's, you can't define it, um, but you can also see it. I mean, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, like the, the Met orchestra player, I think is $15 a month. And in one month you could see a lot of stuff that they're not showing. So there's a, there's a Rosen Cavalier from 1982, um, which is so fantastic, just so fantastic. And, uh, and it's conducted by Levine, and I, you know, there's whatever. Say what you will, he had he had something, way back when. So, anything else? It's been a year, guys. How are all of you? The Met streamings help, Good. even the third time around. You know, <laughs> even how, the third time. I, I mean, I, how many times can you watch Mash? I mean, there's no. <laughs> <laughs> Desiree, did you do any reading about duels? I, I really, I just can't even understand why they had such things. No, I didn't. <laughs> when did it end? I don't, I, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll, t I'll, I'll, it'll, I'll answer it in the, the, the video when I do this. I mean, duels are sort of like <laughs> castrati. It was like a weird thing that people used to do. <laughs> like <laughs> and, and in that um, production that wasn't the minimalist one, um, the duel with rifles. What? <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. It's just wrong. So I haven't I haven't seen that. We don't we I don't always see all of that. We usually duck when there's a loud bang. <laughs> That's the one with Natripko. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 
So do you feel at the end of the opera, do you feel sympathy? Are we supposed to feel sympathy for Onegin? No, I mean, no, I think you feel at the end of the opera, like you feel empty. You know, at the end of Bohem, I cry because I'm like, oh my God, she died and it's terrible. And he didn't know she was going to die. And, and at this, it's like, yeah, well, you get what you deserve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have sympathy for her. I mean, really the opera shouldn't be called on Yegan. It's about Tatiana. It's about her, her transformation from a young schoolgirl who writes a silly letter to someone who clearly is a bad boy to a, a woman who has stature, who realizes that he's just no good. So that's what I think. I find it interesting that um, when he's trying to convince her at the end, he uses a lot of the same phrases that she used in her letter. Oh. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I can't imagine writing a novel in verse. Mm. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's one about San Francisco by Vic, uh, I don't know who, I'll find out. Um, but that's the only other one I've seen, so. Yeah. Vikram Seth. Thank you, who, who hmm. said that? Rosemary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I was just very curious, do you have trouble following Valerie Gergiev's shaky fingers? Thank you for asking that question. You know, <laughs> um, we played with him a lot. I played with him a lot. And um, I think he does it on purpose. If you yeah. watch, if you watch Bernstein, Bernstein also would do uh, stuff like that. The the slow movement of Mahler's fifth, the Adagietto, starts with uh, a, a bass pluck. And Bernstein sort of just went like this, <laughs> like with no, yeah. with no impulse to his feet. <laughs> to know when to come in, that and kind of thing just freaks me out. Does this thing to, to make sure we listen. <sighs> mm. Because sometimes you're on autopilot and you're following and you're not listening. And I think um yeah i think uh yeah so it's difficult and there's some conductors who are better but uh if you look at videos of of carlos kleiber he didn't really conduct the beats either mm -hmm. he sort of mm -hmm. shaped, he shaped the piece yes, he did. And, yes and you got it you know so i really enjoyed the um the clip about the rehearsals with Gergiev because the way he got um, the orchestra to play the repeated passages and to have different feeling for each repetition, you could really never get bored. I think that these, and I, and I am hoping, my hope, so my hope going forward is that the Met will go back and it will be the golden age because there is such incredible pent up demand. People have People have a lot of money in the bank because they haven't been spending money. And I'm hoping that people will give a lot of money and the Met will solve all of these uh, labor issues. And that eventually we'll go back to doing more of these um, HDs because I think the HDs have beautiful production value. And while it is not the same experience as uh, going to the opera, it is a cultural event. It is educating. It is, um, I think it's important that we continue um, promoting music, culture, art. And, um, and I don't, I don't think that opera is the only art that should be promoted. I just think that there are people who like being seen at the opera who have a lot of money who will give the opera a lot of money. I'm just, I'm just hoping. And, um, and so my, my personal plan is that uh, in anticipation of HD performances, I'm gonna keep doing these lectures. So whenever there's gonna be an HD on a Saturday, I'm gonna prepare and hopefully uh, I'm in Dallas, hopefully I can find some group who will listen to me talk and I'll take them on a field trip to the movie theater. Um, because I think that the production value of these HD, because they take you backstage, because they show you the, and the, you know, the orchestra at the very beginning, they didn't tell us they were gonna do this. And so 
we didn't have warning. They showed up to some rehearsal we were doing for some really difficult piece with a film crew the first day of rehearsal. And our concert master was like, no, this, 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 this is not okay. <laughs> and so it's been a work in progress, but over the, over the course of time, they've really, they do a great job. Mm, yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Got to go. Thank you guys for your support. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you, Days. Have a love you too, Lisa. <laughs> have a great uh, have a great weekend, and um, see you. I think maybe at the end of April. Okay. Ciao. And okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Send me an email. And Elena. 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 Sorry. It's Italian. If you can find that YouTube link of that op, the Onyekin in Yeah, I'll send it to you. Send it to you. me and I'll put it on because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upload the video later. It's and very, also the translation. Yeah. I'm sorry, Louise? And also the translation. Yes. The, the, yeah. It was a. I don't have the author's name already. Mitchell, right? Somebody Mitchell who did the other translation, right? Uh, yeah. Um, Stanley Mitchell. Mitchell. Yeah. It's okay. Penguin Classics. It's really great. I will include that. And in it's screamingly funny, this, this, these verses. It's very sharp and great. Yeah, it's really good. Thank you all. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.